<laughs> this Soul Search new series is we will be asking ourselves some very crucial questions to which the answers determine the course of your life or our life. Soul Search. That's what happens when we soul search. What is soul searching? According to dictionary.com, soul searching is a penetrating examination of oneself, motives, beliefs, attitudes, and direction. And when we soul search, we ask ourselves crucial questions. Say crucial. Crucial. Crucial questions. We need to ask those questions, very important determining questions. I love the word crucial. You see, the word crucial comes from the word, or the Latin word crux. Say crux. Crux. That is the Latin word for cross. The crux is the intersection between two lines. We have an example here. It's almost like hitting that, that um, four-way stop. That intersection is the crux. Where you turn determines where you are headed. So you make a decision even before you hit that crossroad, right? Even before you hit that four-way stop, the crux. We all come to cruxes in our lives. And uh, sometimes deliberately, sometimes we are taken by surprise. And we realize we are in the middle of a crossroad. See, that four-way stop, that crux, like I said, whichever uh, you turn to will determine the direction or the course and even your destiny. The crux, the crossroads. Soul searching is hitting that intersection. And if we don't know and we, if we haven't determined our direction before we get to that crossroad, It'll take a lot of time for us to stay there and figure out where am I going? What am I doing here? Who am I? Questions like that. And so when we hit that intersection, we ask ourselves self-defining, life-altering, direction-changing questions. And I'm not just talking about geographical directions here. I'm talking about our life our spiritual life, our emotional life, our married life, our single life. And eventually lead us to our destiny. So today we'll be talking about a man, a man named Jacob. Say Jacob. That's a beautiful name. I have a nephew named Jacob. It's a beautiful name now. You know, most, most Jacobs that I know are nicknamed Kobe. Who likes Kobe? The best basketball player? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but Jacob. We were talking about Jacob from the Old Testament. Now, who is Jacob? And what is his significance in the life of, of this church or in the life of, of the Old Testament or in general, everything that we hold dear and true. Who was Jacob? Jacob, we find his story beginning in Genesis chapter 25, at the very first book of the Old Testament. So it's an old story. Jacob was the grandson of Abraham. We talked briefly about Abraham last week. And so we find his story in Genesis 25. So if you, have, if you have your Bibles, open your Bibles to Genesis 25. And if you don't have your Bibles, it's all on the screen. Um, we'll be reading from verse 21. That's where his story begins. I read, Isaac, who is Abraham's son, pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. But the two children struggled with each other in her womb, so she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me? She asked. And the Lord told her, The sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. That's a scary prophecy about brothers. And when the time came to give birth, Rebekah discovered that she did indeed have twins. The first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat. 
You know, when I read this, I was reminded of, of Elmo. You know Elmo? Red and hairy. And so the first one, like you said, was very red and covered with thick hair like a fur coat. So they named him Esau, which means hairy. So they nicknamed him Harry. Harry Potter. I'm kidding. That's, that's corny. I'm sorry. Anyway, so he was uh, given that name, Esau, which means Harry. So they named the other one, according to verse 26. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel. Very interesting scenario here. Esau came out, followed by Jacob, holding on to the heel of the older brother. So they named him Jacob, which means heel grabber. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. Very interesting scenario, like you said. Jesus, uh, Jacob came out of, of the womb grasping the heel of his older brother, hence the name Jacob, heel grabber. But, but that's just one of the meanings to the name Jacob. The other meaning to that name is deceiver, supplanter, the one who takes advantage of others. Who would want to be named that? I can't imagine my, my mother naming me the boy who eats a lot. Right? It would have been true, but I would not be talking to my mother. I would not have talked to my mother for a long time for naming me, hey, the boy who, you know, for, for Jacob, he was named the heel grabber, the deceiver, the, the deceiver, the, the supplanter, the one who takes advantage of other people. That's a weird name to give to a son. And verse 27 says, as the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoors man. But Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. Two boys, twins, two different personalities, two different likings. One was an outdoors man. Who's an outdoors man here? Outdoors man here. Who loves hunting? None of you? None of you? And we're in Western Canada? Anyway, so this guy, Esau, loved hunting. The other one loved to stay at home and cooked. Who likes to cook? All right, you guys are all Jacobs. Anyway, and according to this scripture, according to the scripture, verse 28, Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home. Favoritism at the very onset. The dad loved the deer, the moose, the elk, the beaver. We don't eat beaver, right? We, we don't, no. The, all the, uh, the game. And, and so I, Isaac enjoyed eating whatever Esau brought, and so he was the favorite of the dad. But Rebecca loved Jacob, the homeboy, the cook, the more domesticated guy, the husband material. But I'd like to point out here, at the very onset of their relationship as brothers, that even here, they've experienced rivalry. And also to point out the danger of favoritism. 29, one day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. And this is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. 31, all right, Jacob replied. But trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Here we find Jacob heel grabbing again. Heel grabbing, pulling his brother, taking advantage of his brother's position. He saw the hunger as an opportunity to take advantage. Verse 32, look, I'm dying of starvation, Esau said. What good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. You see, that swear or that taking of an oath makes everything legal, especially in the sight of the God that they believe in. For, and, and to continue, so Esau swore an oath, thereby making it legal, 
selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn son. Very interesting scenario once again. Here we find Esau acting foolishly, or the more common word is stupid. Acting stupidly, he put more weight on his hunger than the value of his birthright. Now, what is, what is important about the birthright? And even from my perspective, the culture that I come from, the firstborn son always gets the greater goods. I'm not sure if that is the culture where you're from. But from my culture, the oldest boy always gets a, whole, a big chunk of the property. The, a big chunk of the savings, a big chunk of the dad's uh, riches. And so it was the same in this culture. And Jacob saw that and, and, and realized, I can take advantage of my brother because I'm younger. When my dad dies, I'm not going to get a lot. And so he took advantage of the brother. And the stupid brother put more weight on his hunger than his birthright. When Esau gave up his birthright, he wasn't just giving up money. He wasn't just giving up property. He was giving up who he was. The firstborn son of Isaac. You see, a lot of us have made that mistake once, twice, or many times in our lives where we give up who we are for one hour of romantic excitement, for one hour of pleasure, or maybe 30 minutes of high. We give up who we are. You're a child of God, and when a temptation comes in front of you, you forget who you are and grab the opportunity of enjoying for 30 minutes, for 10 minutes, even three minutes. That's what happened to Jacob and Esau. Jacob saw an advantage Esau was taken advantage of. And like I said, foolishly, this guy put more weight on his physical need rather than who he was. Sometimes that is true of all of us. Oh, I'm a believer in Jesus, but at the face of temptation, we forget who we are. And of course, what happened was, at the end of their father's life, close to the end of their father's life, Jacob was able to get the blessing from his father, thereby leaving Esau with very little. And he had to, to deal with things, and he had to, to earn things on his own, and not really receive a lot of stuff from the father. And as a result, in Genesis 27, 41, it says, from that time on, Esau hated Jacob, because their father had given Jacob the blessing. And Esau began to scheme. I will soon be mourning my father's death. Then I will kill my brother. Quite a story about brothers. You see, what happens here is that he forgot that he was in a situation that is a result of his foolish decision. He wanted to kill his brother because his brother got the inheritance. He completely forgot that it was his fault. He gave it away legally. He swore an oath. A lot of us like that as well. We forget that what we are going through is a result of our decision, is a consequence of what we did. Now, after that event, Jacob ran away and lived with his uncle Laban. Say Laban. That is the uncle. And if you read Genesis 27 to 31, you'll notice that Jacob's life is filled with deception, with lies, with, with 
taking advantage of other people, and he had been taken advantage of as well by others. All his life can be described as one cheat after another. His whole life is all about grabbing people's heels, trying to get rich by taking advantage of others. Jacob had crab mentality. Are you familiar with that? The mentality, the crab mentality is, if I can't have it, you can't have it either. If you're in the bucket with me, I'll make sure that you stay in the bucket with me. Or, if I go down, you come down with me. You see, if you put a bunch of crabs, like live crabs in a bucket, individually they can escape. But if you will observe, none of them ever do. Because every time one crab reaches close to the top, one crab tries to pull the leg of that one that is succeeding. Heel grabbing. If you are wanting to succeed, I want to succeed too. And I will make sure that you don't succeed <laughs> the way I succeed. Heel grabbing. All his life. He also had this me first mentality. If I can, like I said, if I can't have it, you can't have it either. Jacob, whose life can be described as a life of deception, every step he took and every choice he made propelled him to certain directions. But all those choices and all those steps had consequences. To every action, there is a reaction. That is a law, a natural law, in fact. And so, one of the biggest consequences of the actions that Jacob took was fear. He feared his brother. That's why he ran away. He ran away to his father, to his, to his mother's brother, Laban. And even after so many years living away from Esau, he was still afraid of what Esau could do. So he stayed away from Esau's land, Edom. You see, there are days when our past haunts us. Something you've done, something you've not done something you said, something you did not say, a foolish decision, a terrible mistake, whatever, they have a way of creeping back into our memories and taunt us, right? There are days when you see a person and you remember, ah, oh, I did something really cruel. Ah, oh, I did something, I said something really bad. And you would rather not be in the presence of that person. That is the way it is. And that is why the choices and our decisions should be made in wisdom, prayer, and God's word. Because even little choices may have huge consequences. Do you agree? And these consequences could haunt us for the rest of our lives. Every time you remember what you did, what you said, you cringe. So now we come to Genesis chapter 32, where Jacob finds himself at a crux, at an intersection. He needed to make a decision. Because the truth of the matter is, his inheritance was legal. He got it legally, because the brother gave it up, swore an oath. What did he need to do? He needed to go back to his father's land to take possession of it, because he legally inherited it. But you see, after living with um, Laban, the uncle, after getting married twice, after having 11 children, after growing rich because of deception, he needed to go back to that land and he's just scared for his life. And for the life or lives of the people under him. At this point, he had 11 sons 
and two wives. Afraid of the past. How do I get to my property? How do I take possession of it? Here's the problem. He hits a crossroad. What is the crossroad? In order for him to get to the, the father's property, he needed to go through his brother's land called Edom. This was his journey. And you say, ah, that red line, that's, that's his journey. And you could, have, you could say, he could have taken the other route. Like he could have gone south or he could have gone a little west, like through Sidon and Tyre to Shechem and Bethel. Right? You see, Jerusalem, Shechem, Bethel, that's his father's property. That's where he needed to go. His brother's property is Ramoth, Gilead, Jericho, Abel, Shittim, Hebron, that area. He had to go through his brother's property. And like I said, you can reason with him, not me, that he could have gone around. But God had a plan. He needed to go through that land because he, he knew that he needed to make peace with his brother. And so he walked towards that land of Edom. And in Genesis chapter 31, the last part, as he was making his way to his brother's land, he saw angels appear before him. And when he saw those angels, he said, this is God's camp. Meaning, this is the way God wants me to go. I do not need to go the other route or route. I need to go through this land. It became an assurance for Jacob that he was on the right track. So what did he do? He sent messengers to his brother in Genesis chapter 32. Then Jacob sent messengers ahead to his brother Esau, who was living in the region of Seir, in the land of Edom. He told them, give this message to my master Esau, humble greetings from your servant Jacob. Very nice opening to a letter. Until now, I have been living with Uncle Laban, and now I own cattle, donkey, flocks of sheep and goats, and many servants, both men and women. I have, see, I have sent these messengers to inform my Lord of my coming, hoping that you will be, read that for me, friendly to me. Hoping that he would be friendly to him. Here we find Jacob taking a bold step but being very cautious and hoping that his brother would be friendly. Verse six says, after delivering the message, the messengers returned to Jacob and reported, we met your brother Esau, and he is already on his way to meet you with an army of 400 men. If you were Jacob, how would you feel? You just sent peace officers to the brother, sending a really nice note and then what do you get back? Oh, your brother's preparing for something. He has an army of 400. Verse seven, Jacob was terrified of the news, naturally. So what did he do? He divided his, his household along with the flocks and herds and camels into two groups. He thought Esau meets one, if Esau meets one of the group and attacks it, perhaps the other can escape. Very shrewd, very clever. But he was willing to sacrifice half of his people, half of his property. But in verses 9 to 12, for the first time we find Jacob praying. Praying to God. And he says in his prayer, O God of my grandfather Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, you told me, return to your own land and to your relatives, and you promised me I will treat you kindly. Verse 10, very good realization. I am not worthy of all the unfailing love and faithfulness you have shown me, your servant. When I left home and crossed the Jordan River, I owned nothing except a walking stick. He was poor when he moved to Laban's land. And he says, I owned nothing except a walking stick. Now my household fills two large camps. 
Oh Lord, please rescue me from the hand of my brother Esau. I am afraid that he is coming to attack me, along with my wives and children. But you promised me I will surely treat you kindly, and I will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the sands along the seashore, too many to count. He is recounting the promise of God to his grandfather Abraham. The promise of God to his grandfather Abraham was what? His children will be as many as the stars. And so in his prayer, Jacob is saying, you have promised this. You have promised this God. So I have the right to claim it because you promised it. What do you do with the promise? You claim it. And he's claiming the promise. But I see a problem in, in the whole scenario here too. You see, Jacob was about to face the biggest threat in his life, his own brother, so he prayed. Is that a good thing? It's a good thing to pray. But you will notice if you read the scripture once again, you'll notice that even before he prayed, he already had his own personal plans laid out, right? God was a second resort. He had his own plan, uh, own, own course of action planned already. And then he prays. Isn't that often the case with us? Oh, I'm going to do this and this and this and this. God bless it. Right? I'm going to go there and this and that and do that. God bless it. What I see here is a, re a reverse. The best way that we find here as an example is the, is the opposite. Go to God first and say, God, I need your direction. And so you will notice if we read the whole story, God does have a different plan for, for Jacob. Let's read on. It says um, in, in verse Verses 13 to 21, I will try to appease him by sending gifts ahead of me. When I see him in person, perhaps he will be friendly to me. Even at this point, Jacob was fully relying on his ability to appease his brother. But like I said, God has a different plan. But in his head, his plan goes first. And he's asking God to bless his plan. Verse 22, during the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives. Again, he was pursuing his plan. And two servant wives and his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. Verse 24, then Jacob, all alone at the camp. Very important scenario. At this point, God had always wanted for Jacob to find himself alone. Why? Because there are times in our lives when God wants us to realize that as long as there are people to give orders to, as long as there are people to manipulate, as long as there are people to control, or as long as you think you're in control, you will never, ever call on God. As long as I have strength in my body, I am going to pursue my dreams. But when you lose your strength in your body, you begin to call on God. And this is what's happening now in Jacob's life. He finds himself alone. And what happened when he found himself alone? And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. That's a long wrestling match. All night, all night, a man came along at, at the beginning of the night and started to wrestle with Jacob. According to many Bible scholars, this man is a messenger from God, an angel. But a lot of Bible scholars also believe that this is a theophany. Say theophany. Theophany. It's a combination of the words theo and phanea, which means the face of God. A theophany is, is the belief that God or Jesus, the Son of God, appeared in many different ways and occasions before he was born. This is the pre-incarnate 
appearance of Jesus. So even in the Old Testament, Jesus had already been appearing. And that is what many Bible scholars believe. You will find out why later. Now, this man started to wrestle with him, and they wrestled all night, all night long. Verse 25, when the man saw that he could not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of socket. Then the man said, let me go. I feel like singing that. Let me go. Anyway, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What's your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. 28, your name will no longer be Jacob. The man told him, from now on you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the, the place Peniel, which means the face of God. For he said, I have seen the face of God. This is what I'm talking about. That man that he wrestled with was not an ordinary man. For according to Jacob himself, he has seen the face of God. Yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. Even today, the people of Israel don't eat a tendon near the hip socket because of what happened that night when the man strained the tendon of Jacob's hip. See, the way God helps us is by breaking us of our inherent self-dependence so that we can totally lean on him. And that is what happened to Jacob at that wrestling match. God wanted him to finally submit, to finally surrender. Enough, Jacob, enough of your scheming, enough of getting rich by your own strength, enough of trying to deceive people, enough. If you are going to be blessed, be blessed in the right way. Do you want that? Do you want to be blessed in the right way? Of course. This is what God wants for him to experience. Enough of your scheming. Enough of your self-dependence. I want you to experience the blessing that I have for you in the right way. Submission is the key to that blessing. But submission, and here's something that's really hard to swallow. Submission requires brokenness. Brokenness is the path to blessing based on this scripture. And when you find yourself, here's an encouragement for all of us, when you find yourself in a situation where you are about to reach your breaking point, that means God is preparing you to receive a major blessing in your life. And before God can use us greatly, he must break us. Break the will. Who loves horses here? For those people who love horses, if you catch a horse in the wild, like a Mustang, you don't ride it right away. You have to break it. That's the term that they use. You have to break the horse. You have to break the will of the horse to submit to you. I'm not saying that we're like horses, but in a way we are all wild. We all want to do our own things, right? We want to be left to ourselves and, and to our own decisions. But God wanted to break Jacob because God has a plan. And so here's the first lesson that we find here in this story. God must break us of our self-dependence so, so that we can learn to depend on him so that we can learn to depend on him. There's a paradox here, too. You see, when Jacob was wrestling with a man, Jacob seemed to have incredible strength because the man was ready to give up. Did you notice that? When it says here, when, when the man realized that he was not going to win, he wanted to let go. Let us read it together. It says, then the man, he, according to verse 25, saw that he would not win the match. He would not win the match. How strong could Jacob have been? 
for that man to give up, almost give up in the wrestling match. Of course, the Lord could have loosened his grip, right? And he could have gotten away. But here's a principle that I love about this word. The Lord loves it when his children cling to him. And even most especially in our brokenness, especially when we say, God, I will not let go. That's what Jacob said. I will not let you go until you bless me. If you're going through tough situations this week, maybe physical, financial, emotional, or even spiritual, whatever it is that you're going through, I want you to, to have a time this week to lift up your hands and symbolically grip the arm of God and say, God, I will not let go until you bless me. God, I will not let go. I will not let go. Can we do that together? Lift your hand. And symbolically grip the hand of God and say, I will not let go. Never let go of the hand of God. For it is in clinging to God that we experience the blessing of his strength. And that's the second lesson. Never loosen your grip of God because it is when we cling to him in our brokenness, we experience the blessing of his strength. His strength becomes your strength. You see, when you're limping and you, you lean on something stronger, the strength of that upon which you lean becomes yours, right? So when you cling to God and lean on him, his strength becomes yours. When Jacob clings to the Lord and demands that he bless him, what did the Lord say? What is your name? What is your name? That is one of the first questions we need to ask ourselves when we soul search. Because that question is a question of identity and purpose. Who you are and what you are meant to be, right? And for a long time, since the birth of Jacob, all he knew who he was was Jacob, the heel grabber. Yaakov, the one who supplants, the one who takes advantage of people. See, that, that name, to us it sounds like a name, right? It's almost like saying Ambeth. Ambeth doesn't make sense as a sentence, right? But the name Yaakov is a sentence, is a phrase, which means heel grabber. And so every time he gave his name to anyone who asks of it, he is reminded of who he was and what he does and what he's good at. What's your name? What did he say? Jacob. One word. Jacob. Because it's a sentence already. And again, he was reminded of who he was and what he did. And what did God say? Beautiful. It says here, God speaking prophetically says, your name will no longer be Jacob. From now on, you will be called Israel. For you have fought with God and with men and have won. At this crossroad, at this crux, at this time of soul searching, he realizes that he needed a new name. He realizes that God wanted to do something greater in his life. And so he receives this new name, Israel, which, which has two meanings. If you, if you study Hebrew, it means he who prevails with God. But the other meaning to it, which is interesting, means God prevails. Very interesting. Both meanings have now become true to Jacob. You see, when Jacob wrestled with God and prevailed, God blessed him. But the other side of it is when God 
was able to win the heart of Jacob. He prevailed over him. But what's interesting in this new name is this. The name Israel. When God changed his name, God did not promise a smooth sailing life. In fact, the name Israel itself is a prophecy of a struggle. Because it says, he who prevails, right? If you think about it, how do you prevail without a fight? How do you win without a struggle? So the very name Israel means you will have a lot of trials. You will have a lot of things to face. Like even to this day, the descendants of Jacob, the people of Israel are struggling to keep their land. If you read the news or you watch the news, you will know that to this day, some people don't want the Israelites, the people of Israel, to be where they are. To this very day, they're struggling. And if you read back in the Old Testament, all their lives, they had to struggle. In fact, in the 1940s, late 1930s, they had to struggle in Europe because there was one man who wanted to wipe out the people of Israel from the face of the earth. It was a struggle. But here's what's good about the prophecy, about that name. You will have struggles, but you will prevail. You will have struggles, but you will prevail. You will prevail. Say, you will prevail. Beautiful name. The prophecy is still true to this day. But one thing that I'd like for us to see here as well is that he was given a new name at the beginning of a new day. You see, they fought until the break of dawn, right? What is the break of dawn? It's the morning. It's the beginning of a new day. He was given a new name at the beginning of a new day. What does that mean? God wants people to experience a new beginning in him. God is willing to forget your past and forgive your past in order for you to pursue a great future with him as you prevail, as you struggle and as you prevail, as you struggle, as you prevail. God wants you to have a new beginning. And here's the third lesson that I find here. God gives us new beginnings to enjoy our inheritance in a way that pleases him. The life of Jacob, if you look at his, his story, he was rich. Like he enumerated how much, rich, how much riches he had when he wrote a letter to his brother. But all those riches he got from deceiving people. And at this new dawn in his life, God is saying, I want you to enjoy blessings. I want you to be blessed in the right way so that you can enjoy it in a way that pleases me. Do you want to enjoy God's blessing in the way that pleases God? Maybe it's time for us to soul search and be reminded of who we are in Christ. If you are a, a person here who wants and needs a new beginning, maybe that is today. Maybe you need to have that new beginning. Maybe God wants you to begin to cling to him and get rid of your self-dependence and see how God is able to work in your life. You see, if we come into a proper relationship with God, of clinging to him in our brokenness, then we have power with him. We prevail with him. He who has prevailed over us, we prevail with him. And since God is over all, God is all powerful, if we can prevail with him, then we prevail over all our circumstances. And that's the good thing about trials, right? The good thing about trials is that they don't really last forever. This too shall pass. But it's important to prevail with the power of God. As Israel, no longer Jacob, went limping 
to meet his brother Esau the following day. If you read the story, he was more powerful than he ever was when he had full strength on his own. He went limping to face his brother, maybe physically limping, but more blessed. So when you search your soul, first you should know who you are in God. The next time you come to a crossroad in your life, first remember who you are in God. You are a child of God. Say, I'm a child of God. That is who you are. The next time you are faced with a temptation, remember who you are. I am a child of God. Remember, the next time you face a financial difficulty, remember that you are a child of God. Remember, the next time you have an emotional battering, remember, you are a child of God. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget who you are. The next time you need to make a decision, remember who you are. Because when you remember who you are in God, your next decision, your next step will have to be something that pleases your God. So that you will enjoy his blessings in a way that pleases him. Here's what we close with. Here's a thought. When you cling to God, you prevail with God. Let's stand to our feet and close with a word of prayer. And let's just commit this time to our uh, God and, and, and just acknowledge that we will prevail in him. Bow your heads and pray with me. Our Father, we thank you for the story of Jacob. Happened many thousands of years ago, yet still bringing true to this very day that you are a faithful God. You're a God who is willing to give people a second chance in life, a new beginning, willing to forgive and forget the past, just so that we will be able to pursue the future that you have for us. We thank you, Lord, for the example of Israel. Today, Father, I know that there are people here who might be going through struggles, who might be wrestling with things. I pray that at the crossroad of their life right now, they would realize who they are in you, first and foremost, so that the decision that they make following that realization will be something that will please you. I pray, Father, for those who are needing comfort, for those who are needing help. I pray, Father God, that you would be that strong arm to cling to, that strong arm to lean on. And I pray, God, that you would never allow for them Allow for them to feel that they are alone. May they always remember that you are with them. Lord, for those who need to make a decision this week, I pray that your wisdom be upon them. May they be willing to let go of their self-dependence and all of their plans Chuck it out and, and come to you for guidance. For I know that when you are the one guiding, everything that happens will be according to your will and it is good and pleasing and perfect. God, I pray for those who are hurting physically, emotionally, spiritually. I pray that they would experience the opposite of what Jacob felt. Instead of a dislocated joint, they would experience a touch of healing in their bodies. To remind them that you alone are the great physician. And God, I lift up to you every person under the sound of my voice this morning. May we always remember who we are. And may we always cling to you, for when we cling to you, we prevail with you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray, and all God's people said. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week. See you next week.
Blessings on you. Cling to God, for he clings to you.